Hello. Happy Halloween. And it's been a while. Um, so, yeah, there's been some things happening. Um, personal stuff, family stuff, health stuff. So, um, yeah, Sir Chunk and I have both been not really that involved this month. Um, and apologies for that. I'm going to try to do better in November. And hopefully we will. <laughs> we'll see how things go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's getting into that time of year as well, you know, November, and then especially into December where it's tougher to do things. But I'm also sort of um, hopefully, you know, that some of the health stuff will um, has gotten a little bit better and, you know, we'll be in better shape to do more. Um, I have about like 50 tags as like a piled up list of tags to do. So we're not doing any this month. Um, this is my, our only posting for October. Um, it's just going to be our recap of reading and viewing. Um, yeah, so pretty, um, pretty weak month. Apologies. But, you know, it's a new month and we, I read some really, really great things that I actually really enjoyed the movies, um, some of the movies we watched. So, pretty good overall, even though there wasn't, you know, a lot of information. So, um, I think I'll start with reading, and I can, um, I don't think Sir Chong has done a great deal. Um, I think he read one book, or two, actually. Oh, even, th or there were three, so. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you a little bit, um, what he did, and then we'll kind of um, quickly move on. Um, so I don't even have information really for him. Just, I know he spent, he started reading Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark back in, I don't know, August, late August, early September. Um, and you know, in to begin with, it's tough to get a lot done in the beginning of the school year, um, for teachers. And then on top of that, you know, he takes like a thousand page book, that isn't exactly like a fast paced read, but he did really enjoy it. Um, he gave it four stars and he said, it's basically like a fantasy version of Jane Eyre. Um, really enjoyed it. I know he really liked Piranesi as well. So he's, he's on the Susanna Clark, um, fan bandwagon. So, um, I mean, he may want to give a bit longer review, but that's all I, I'm just going to pass on, you know, what I know he read. Um, and then he read for school, Drown City, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Um, he said it was a quick, good read, and it was impactful. And if you wanted to introduce, you know, younger readers and middle grade readers to Hurricane Katrina, um, since at this point, you know, obviously they're young and they don't really know because they weren't around during then, during that time. Um, and then he recently read The Outrageous Origin, Garfield's Pet Force Number 1, um, which is Garfield and his friends getting superpowers. And he's like, it was a three-star book. If you are reading a book about Garfield getting superpowers, you know what you're getting. So you'll enjoy it. Or you won't, if you don't want to read that. So I'm going to now move into my books. Um, so the first book I read this month, I absolutely loved. It was one of my favorites of the year. Um, and this is Penance from Eliza Clark. Um, I haven't read Boy Parts, and I know that's really, really popular. Um, but, so Eliza Clark, she wrote this sort of, um, it's written, so it's written basically as a true crime book. So, yeah, it's, um, it's written, sorry, I was just checking on something for, uh, work. Um, so... Penance is basically the story. It's written as if, essentially, this man had written this true crime, journalistic, nonfiction book um, about this um, murder of a teenage girl by girls she knew, her friends, essentially. Um, and then, you know, because of all the controversy about it and the people who were, you know, involved in the incident and people who were affected by it, um, kind of protested his publication, um, so that this is being presented as if it was removed from publication, and then a new publisher kind of jumped in and said, we feel that people have the right to make decisions and decide if they want to read it, whether or not 
you know, with whatever happened. So what I really liked about this book, I mean, I liked it in general. I always like, you know, dark um, kind of horror stuff, things that are about um, sort of troubled teenage girls, um, you know. And so I like that, but I'm not, I'm actually not a big true crime reader. And one of the things, the reasons I don't like true crime is because I feel like it can be really exploitative. Um, and I mean, obviously there's some element of, um, how long it's been. So, you know, I like, I like the concept. I mean, obviously I love crime fiction and I like the concept. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of documentaries. I'm a fan of, um, journalism, but I I think what happens a lot of the time in true crime stuff, you know, is it's a cold case and then everyone starts to think that they're detectives and, or they treat it the same way they would treat solving a crime in a fiction story, but these are real people's lives. And so I, I tend to get a little, I'm very wary of like sort of that true crime world, um, I'm not saying, you know, like, I'm a better person than people who like it or anything like that. I'm not saying anything about people who like it. I just, I think as a whole, I I personally just feel a little bit uncomfortable because I think, like, you know, there's there's real people there. Um, And, you know, I don't think I realize that it, like, affected me, but um, I recently had read something and I somehow it came up. I was thinking about um, a crime that happened in my town where I was grow- when I grew up, and actually there were two really major, major, like nationally newsworthy um, murders in my town, um, both that had direct impact on me um, and on my life. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, friends and family, like super close friends and family or anything like that, um, but... One involved um, my sister's teacher, and um, and it was, I mean, that was, like, national news, and I actually, and it, one of the relatives of um, so the, the, the killer um, was in my grade as well in middle school, um, so that was obviously really impactful, and, you know, that's been on, it's been featured on a bunch of, like, true crime um channels and episodes and stuff and then there was another one where a girl I grew up with that I was in Girl Scouts with um actually murdered her sister and that was also on like true tv featured um and so I wasn't like super close with her but I mean I you know I was in Girl Scouts with her we were in the same grade like you know and I, I grew up in a small town so um those so I don't know maybe that has some impact on how I feel about true crime but So essentially, Penance is kind of, what I liked about the book is it sort of talks about some of these issues. You know, how everybody in the town, like, is impacted by this event and, you know, the friends, the family, the people who were, like, directly connected to the people that this happened to. You know, either the the people, the girls who did it or the victim. um, And how, like, that changes people um but it was really I mean it just was very interesting because every single time you would like start to form thoughts and opinions about something something new would come in that would kind of change how you looked at things and I really liked how Eliza Clark I think adds a lot of nuance because like there are parts where you're reading about the the killers and you're very sympathetic to them and then you kind of have to be like yes I mean they it, they are sympathetic and they went through a lot of traumas and they had reasons but at the same time they're still murderers you know and at what point is it like I mean do we do we say oh well you know teenage girls there's a lot of things that happen and they have all these trauma and then at what point do we have to kind of say yes but that doesn't make it okay you know obviously it doesn't make it okay but I mean at what age, like, is there reform? At what point, you know, is it like, they're too old to be doing this? Um, and it's no longer, like, sympathetic, you know? Um, I mean, they're 16, so, like, even with trauma, lots of people have trauma, you know? And so what I like, though, is that she doesn't write in a way that's, 
you know, this is my opinion and this is how this is. Um, and you should not like true crime or you should not be intrigued by true crime or you should not be sympathetic to killers or you should be sympathetic to killers. Like, it's very nuanced. And every time, like, you'd feel like there was, like, a clear kind of answer, something would change and you're like, there is no answer. Like, these are not, these are not situations that are simple. Um, and I, I just thought, I mean, it's amazingly written just a lot of empathy, um, just in general for all kinds of people, a lot of uh, social commentary about, um, you know, the, the challenges of growing up as a teenage girl, um, a lot about class structure, about, you know, how like certain crimes get media coverage and other ones don't, you know, how the media can also, like, in this case, this crime kind of went under the radar because it was in the middle of Brexit. And so, you know, what our focus is and how, like, certain things can happen and people, are like, are, can't pay attention to everything. Um, there's also, you know, an element of one of the killers, her father was, like, a leader, leading politician. So, I mean, how much, you know, privilege there is. Um, and then there was also one of the killers that was, like, obsessed with, um, a school shooter, and so, you know, having access to this information, does that make us, you know, does it have, like, a negative, you know, implication for, you know, people, obviously, when you're young, when you're a teenager, um, you know, you're not necessarily in the same place cognitively as you are when you get older, um, not saying that, you know, I mean, plenty of things, you know, I'm sure when I was 16, I are not part of my personality now, but there are a lot of things that still are. And, you know, and I think we can't kind of just write those things off, but we also have to kind of think about like, you know, we have a different, our executive function is a lot less, <laughs> I guess, um, when we're younger. And so, um, and just the way we think about things and like why, you know, younger people can be prone to violence, um, so a lot of, uh, just a lot of really interesting commentary. And then obviously the role of Tumblr and social media, because uh, in particular it was Tumblr in this book, but um, just the way social media and the internet and being constantly online and how these things can impact us and kind of change our perception um, of reality in a way. So I, I loved this book. I mean, it was, like I said, I think it's one of my favorites of the year. Um, obviously when I, the end of the year comes, you know, kind of see what has, still has an impact on me, but this is the kind of book, you know, I'm already like planning on going out and buying a copy. Like, I just really, really love this book. Um, so highly recommend Penance by Eliza Clark. And then I, um, so that was an arc and I have so many arcs. I'm so far behind. I feel awful. Um, the next one was an arc as well. And this was The Night House by Joe Nesbo. Um, I thought Joe Nesbo was a woman, <laughs> it's a man, um, and I know he's really, really popular, um, as a writer, and so I've never actually written any, read, read any of his books, um, and I was excited to get to try this, and this is actually, like, horror, and I guess normally he writes more, um, thrillers and, like, detective kind of stuff, um, and this is, like, just straight-up horror, um, very, like, it was a really good book, like, I didn't love it, mostly just because I was, like, nothing sort of groundbreaking, um, but definitely, like, if you like, like, old school horror, kind of, like, Dean Koontz, Stephen King, that 70s, 80s horror, um, especially, like, with, like, a, I, I don't want to say a YA feel, because it's not YA at all, um, the character's younger, so that, you know, has a little bit, but, it's not YA, um, by any means, um, but kind of like that 80s sort of horror feel, um, where it's like both, I guess, a coming of age story and horror, um, so yeah, it was very well written, really enjoyed, like, the story, like I said, I didn't necessarily love it, but I really strongly would recommend it, um, it's just pretty solid, um, sort of classic horror, so I liked that, um, and then All the Things We Never Said, um, this is a YA novel about a group of kids who, um, want to commit suicide, who kind of meet up on this website where you can, like, partner with someone and plan your suicides together, 
Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to totally... I don't think I got the full experience from this book because the formatting was really messed up. And, you know, every character has, like, a different narrative style. And one of them is, you know, very choppy to begin with. Um, it's like journaling. And so I, I just really wasn't able to get into the book at all because... I was like so hung up on like trying to figure out what was being what was happening because of the formatting, because um, again it was an arc. Um, but you know I've I don't I, so I can't really speak too much to it. Um, I know some people were like concerned; they thought it was a little like reductive. Um, other people seem to really like it, and you know I'm I'm a big fan of contemporary um, YA, especially you know things that don't shy away from difficult topics like you know, suicide and, you know, the reality of what kids go through when they want to commit suicide. So um, while I'm not, you know, I, I can't speak to how totally, you know, connected I would be to it if I had been able to really read it fully in my, um, you know, without getting stuck on the formatting. Um, that's that book. And then I another arc, and this was, uh, also, yeah, I think I had... Um, five arcs and then one that was a library book. So this is also an arc and that's That Night in the Woods by Christopher Triana or Trina. Um, I haven't read any of his books before. I know he's a really popular horror author. Um, I I liked this. I mean, this definitely had a good mood. Very creepy. Um, pretty traditional. Like I said, pretty kind of traditional modern horror. Um, the one thing I didn't like about this book is that the overarching plot is really, like, gross. I mean, there is definitely, like, gross-out elements in terms of, like, body horror and just... Well, not really body horror, but just, like, just gore. Um, which I, you know, would definitely warn you that there's some pretty extensive gore. Um, there's, like, sexual assault. There's some, like, really messed up stuff that goes on in this book. It's about a cult. Um, yeah, it's... I don't want to say it's, like, anti-Christian, but it's, it's a cult that's, like, Christian-based. So, I mean, you know, some people find that very, very offensive. Um, I, I love books about cults. I don't <laughs> think cults are really interesting. Um, again, <laughs> going back to, like, my not liking true, I like, you know, I like fiction about these kinds of things. Um, but, so I liked it a lot, except, like I said, it kind of left me feeling dirty afterwards, but mostly just because the, the, the premise of the book is about these older people who go back, um, to the woods, you know, to revisit a night when they were younger that they've never really gotten over. Um, and it has to do with, again, it has to do with like creepiness and monsters and, um, whatnot. And, um, but the over at the you kind of as you get more and more details about what's going on, um, it has like a I'll just say it has like a Rosemary's Baby kind of feel to it, um, and like kind of like the same type of thing where Rosemary's Baby, if you really really think too much about it, is kind of gross. Like you're like oh so basically this group of people are just like forcing this woman to like get pregnant and then you know create fate and spawn um spoiler if you haven't watched rosemary's baby or read that book from you know like 50 years ago um but but i mean that again like it's that's the only thing so i just would say definite content warning on like gore and just general concept if you if you if you're easily like if you're sensitive to things um both, like, horror elements that if you just, like, don't like a lot of things that are kind of gross and just over the, like, extensively horror-based, um, or if you don't like, you know, topics like sexual assault and abuse and, um, you know, and they really bother you, I would probably stay away from this one, but again, I liked it, um, didn't love it, but liked it a lot, um, and then I did love Brother and Sister Enter the Forest, this was not an arc. I borrowed this from the library. And this is a very unique book. Um, it's dark. It's depressing. Um, it's about, essentially, these, this brother and sister. Um, and he, when he is in his late teen years, um, and he's gay, um, he's in a relationship with a guy who 
I mean, has issues. Um, and he has, he's prone to violence. And there's, um, I'll kind of explain the writing style a bit, but basically this event happens and it's left him very traumatized. And his younger sister is also traumatized by it, but like she can't really even articulate it. And their relationship is strained because of it. And so it's kind of about, it's told in like, different times time jumps um it's not necessarily back and forth like it's kind of all over so it's there's like a one period and then it travels back in time back and forth to kind of slowly reveal what happened when they were younger and then it jumps forward again in their lives as they're older and we're continuing to get more and more details about the past and then it time jumps again um but I will say, like, it's very evocative. It's a poetic kind of writing style. So it's a lot of, like, subtle things that you, you know, maybe slowly sort of reveal themselves. But they're never, like, necessarily spelled out. So there's a lot of just piecing it together through, like, their thoughts and some of these images and just what you kind of can gather. Um, it almost reads... It kind of like reads like a dream in a weird way, um, which if you read it, you'll kind of understand. Um, very interesting style of writing, and it's unique. And so, I don't know if it's gonna if it would be for everyone. I love it, um, but again, I love this kind of writing style. I'm really interested in sort of poetic, ambiguous writing, um, and especially poetic, ambiguous writing that deals with dark complicated themes like trauma like abuse like violence um and so all of those things may be tough for a lot of readers um and it may not be the kind of writing they liked as well um i saw a couple comparisons to a little life and i would say it's similar thematically and maybe some of the writing but this is a little more sparse in the writing i mean obviously a little life is like a billion pages long um, this is a fairly short book, um, but it has similarities. Um, I think this is a little less, I don't want to say graphic, because it still deals with some really dark stuff. It's just a little more, um, like I said, poetic and sparse in the writing. So you kind of are piecing things together um, because of the writing style. So you kind of have to do some of the work. Um, and... I will say, you know, go into this being prepared. This is not a happy, neatly tied up story. And I don't even mean happy. I mean, I know it's obviously it's a dark story, but this is not going to have an, it doesn't have a neat ending that ties things together, gives you any form of closure or satisfaction. So if you don't like endings that leave you kind of with, no resolution and especially when you're dealing with like pain and trauma and you're kind of viscerally experiencing some of these things and then it just leaves you with those things to sort of like ponder and sit with if that's not your thing this is not a good book for you but if you love that kind of stuff and that's this is like right up there for me um i highly recommend it i loved the writing here um so this was another really strong read and then my last read, which is probably couldn't be any more different than that one, um, was also an arc. And this is called The Winterton Deception Final Word. Apparently, this is the first in a series. So I don't know if I'm going to continue because it, it was a totally wrapped up story. So I was a little worried, you know, knowing there was a series that I was going to be left like without closure or any kind of completion. And then this kind of book like I wanted. Um, so basically, it compares it to like, the Inheriting Scheme, which I haven't read, and um, Knives Out, which I thought was okay. I was, like, not really on board with that as much as other people. Um, mostly because I just thought it was, like, so super obvious, like, who did it from, like, five minutes into the movie. Um, but this is, I would say, it reminds me a lot of the Western game. So if you liked the Western game when you were a kid... Um, or I guess as an adult, if you read it now and liked it now, um, it's similar. Um, so it's basically about these kids um, who live with their mom um, in a hotel. Um, obviously, they're um, they're struggling. They're you know, in terms of like 
wealth and whatever, and they're, they are live in a town, um, so it's Hope and Gordon, and they live in this town, um, with this really, really wealthy family known as the Wintertons, and they made all their money be, by publishing dictionaries, um, and there are these interesting dictionaries where you have, like, spots where you can put photos of people, um, in your life next to them, so you can, you know, kind of decide who you're going to, you know, name as clever and put a picture there, um, so that's kind of interesting, too, but basically, um, we find out pretty much in like the first chapter that um, Hope and Gordon have never known their father. And they find out previous to the book um, that their father was a Winterton, but he's dead. Um, and so Gordon kind of wants to explore that and like learn more about the Wintertons and see if he can like, you know, be friends with like the, who would be his cousins essentially. And Hope wants nothing to do with them because she just feels like they're just a bunch of rich, naughty people who, like, look down on them because they're not wealthy. And um, and for the record, Hope and Gordon are 12-year-old twins. Um, so so this is a middle-grade book. Um, and I don't read a lot of middle-grade, and not for any reason. Like, I read a decent amount of YA. Um, I'll read children's books if, like, you know, if it appeals to me. Um, I don't have kids, but... Um, this one just really sounded interesting, and I love Weston Game, and so I was kind of like, oh, well, somebody said it was like the Weston Game, so um, I figured I'd give it a try, and I really enjoyed this. This was a five-star read for me. I thought it was, early on, I was worried I wouldn't like it, because the first few chapters, I was like, oh, Hope is so whiny, and like, I mean, I don't know. I don't read enough middle grade, so I don't know if that's like a normal 12-year-old <laughs> behavior. I'm not around 12-year-olds, um, so you know, it was hard for me to kind of get in that mindset, but the plot here is great. So essentially there's this spelling bee, um, where you can win a bunch of money that through a course of events, the spam, they end up in this and it's with the Wintertons run it. And it's generally usually held only by the Wintertons and only the Wintertons can participate, but this year it's been opened up. And so, and it's been moved. It usually is at like this local place and now it's at the Winterton estate. And so, essentially, they're in this old, giant, like, estate with, like, secret passages, this mansion, um, huge library, all these things. And they're at the Spelling Bee, which they're competing in, which is, in its, on its own, kind of fun for me. I love Spelling Bees. Um, and then, on top of that, there's a mystery. And there's a missing manuscript that, um, and there's clues to find this missing manuscript, and whoever will win, like the, um, essentially the, the matriarch of the family who's passed away, they'll win a bunch of money and, um, you know, for finding her manuscript and whatever. Um, and she's cut all her like family out of the will. And so they're participating in this. And so it's essentially just like a mystery slash spelling bee contest slash like fight to the fine finish to find out you know, all these clues, um, but just really fast paced, fun, um, well crafted. And I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. I was like having, like, I couldn't wait to get back to reading it, even though I had like not a lot of time. So, um, yeah. So I, even though I didn't read a ton of books this month, um, only w one I couldn't really get, like just couldn't get into, um, I tried, um, but it was like, you know, like I said, the formatting, two were solid horror reads, and then three were five-star reads, so, um, like I said, it's been kind of, I had a bit of a downturn in, like, late, in August and September, and I wasn't really liking a lot, so maybe that was part of it, too, and then, you know, some personal stuff, and so, um, it was kind of nice to get back into just really enjoying, um, what I was reading, so, and now I'm going to move on to some of what we watched this month. So we watched Skin and Marink. We actually watched it at the end of September, but I figure, you know, October. I'm not normally, normally we don't talk about, like, what we watch, but that was our goal, was we were going to try to watch a bunch of stuff for Halloween, and we did not. We watched, like, a handful, but we did watch some good stuff. So um, Skin and Marink is a very low-budget indie horror movie. Um, it's not for everyone, Um it's my kind of horror movie. It's vague. It's conceptual. Um, it's 
kind of, I mean, there's a lot of, like, interpretations to it. Um, it's sort of a slow, I don't want to say it's a slow burn, it's just a very slow movie. Because, like, the things that happen, you have to just piece together as they slowly unravel. Um, so it's not a long movie, it's only like an hour and 20 minutes, but I mean, a lot of people I've talked to have been like, oh yeah, I gave up on this movie like 20 minutes in. So, um, I mean, it's definitely one that you kind of have to watch the whole thing, but I guess if you aren't into it probably 20 minutes in, you may never be into it. So, um, you know, some people really like it, some people do not. I enjoyed it a lot, so. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's like one of my favorite horror movies of all time, but I thought it was very well made and very well done. And then we started watching the Shudder 101 Scariest Horror Movie Moments of All Time. We only watched the first two episodes, though. Um, so I just thought this is, I just think it's interesting. The problem is we were watching it, like, a lot of times we try to, like, have something we can watch, like, during dinner or whatever. Um, but there's, like, a lot of clips of, like, these movies and some of the scenes are really, really gross. So it became something we didn't want to watch during dinner. And then, like, it's not really the kind of thing we normally would just sit and watch. Like, it's it's good for dinner time because it's short, you know. Um, so um, I don't know if we'll get back to finishing that. Um, and then we finished on um, the newest season of Only Murders in the Building, which was, I mean, it's always good. You know, what is weird about this show is it has a consistently... Like, the first episode is usually really good. Second episode's okay. And then there's this, like, the middle is just fine. Um, and it's a show that I prefer to, like, watch when all the episodes are out. So we did wait. Um, because the first season we watched all at once. The second we tried to watch as they came out. And it just really, like, I wasn't getting into it. And then the third, so we did it again. Um, but I think part of the challenge is it's, like, the middle episodes. And it makes sense why they're... I don't say they're boring, but, you know, they're more, like, ruling out different suspects. Um, and so, but then, like, the first one's usually, like, where the crime happens. And then the last two episodes every season are just super fun and fast-paced. And, you know, it's where everything's pulling, coming together. Um, and I had heard Steve Martin had said that this was the last season and he was done with the show um, and then it hadn't been renewed yet, and so, when we started it, and so I was like, oh, I wonder if, um, but then, like, the, the season definitely ends on a cliffhanger, um, I mean, like, the, it has basically every season, so, you know, like, they wrap up the one crime, and then a new crime happens at, you know, at the end of the, um, season, um, so I'm glad to say that it is coming back at least for a fourth season, and who knows how many more, um, it's a really fun show, though, and, I mean, you can't really go wrong with Martin Short and Steve Martin. Um, so, yeah, I like it. Um, and this season was fun, too. It was kind of interesting because this one wasn't in the building. The other two were in the building, obviously, hence the name. Um, but there was connection to the building. But I, I just was thinking, like, how easy and how interesting, like, theaters are, like, settings for mysteries and horror, so... Um, then we watched Reptile, which was not a horror movie, but a mystery thriller, kind of. We thought it was going to be, like, more of a horror movie. Um, really good, solid, um, thriller. Definitely, like, this was, I think, the director's first movie, too. Like, first full-length feature. Um, and definitely, like, solid director, like, directorial vision and style. So, definitely excited to see something else that comes out by, um, this director. Um, the movie reminded me a lot of Prisoners in just the way it was, like, kind of slow and subtle and, like, some really interesting things were happening. Um, different plot completely, but, and if you haven't seen Prisoners, like, it, like, I think part of the reason is because, like, Prisoners was, like, just a movie we stumbled across and it was amazing. It's, like, one of my favorite movies of all time. And it was kind of like that, like, I don't feel like this got a lot of hype, it just kind of landed on Netflix and then... Justin Timberlake's in it, and Benicio Del Toro and Alicia Silverstone, as you can see. Um, but, yeah, this was interesting. Um, I enjoyed it. And then we watched Totally Killer, which is a horror movie. And this was so much fun. Um, and everyone kept saying it's like Scream meets Back to the Future, and it basically is. So it's about this girl whose mother, um, her mother's friends were murdered back when she was in high school. And so now it's been, you know, 30 years or whatever, 40 years, 35 years. Um... 
And then early in the movie, her mom is murdered, you know, years later on Halloween. And um, so there's a time machine um, and she gets sucked back into the 80s where she's now the same age as her mom. And she's trying to prevent the original murders because then her, you know, the killer won't survive 35 years to be able to come back and kill her mom later um, in the future. So um, really like... I thought it was going to be just like a slapstick kind of comedy, and it's not. It's it's definitely a slasher flick. So it's a slasher flick with, like, fun and style. Um, it kind of reminded me a lot of Scream, just in the way, like, it was, you know, really, it was. it's a slasher movie that just happens to have a lot of, like, fun wittiness to it and some sort of tongue-in-cheek um, meta kind of elements, but it's, you know, at, at its heart, it is 100% a slasher flick. So it's not like parodying slasher flicks or anything. Um, I think this is a Bloomhouse production. And I will say, like, I tend to be really satisfied with movies um, that are Bloomhouse if there's something that appeals to me. Because I do think, like, he as a producer seems pretty smart at being like, this movie will appeal to its target audience. It's doing what it's setting out to do. Um I love Happy Death Day. I think it's hilarious. It's amazing. Again, that's kind of like that. It's like that one, like, where that is also a slasher movie. Like, there's no question it's a murder movie. It's violent. It's, you know, creepy. There's some scares, some jump scares. Um, but it's also really funny. Um, so, but, you know, there's a mystery there, too. And so this was kind of similar. So I enjoyed it. I loved it. It's free on Amazon Prime. So, I mean, you can't really go wrong for free. Um... And then we watched um, Chad Gets the Axe. It's hashtag Chad Gets the Axe. And I was so excited for this. I've been, like, waiting, like, months to watch this movie. I was like, I want to watch this in October. Um, and so it's basically about um, these TikTokers, basically, um, who are influencers. Um, and they go to this house where there were a bunch of murders and a cult lived. Um, so what's kind of, so it was really funny. Um, but it actually is pretty damn scary and suspenseful. So I thought it was like going to be like funny, like just a comedy throughout. I didn't, I thought it was just making fun of like influencers and like internet culture and social media and just going to be silly. And it's not. Like, it basically, it reminded me a lot of Blair Witch Project. It's like, if you took Blair Witch Project and moved it, you know, 30 years in the future, um, 25 years in the future, it kind of reminds me of that. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the Blair Witch Project. It's probably, I think it's still the most terrifying movie I've ever seen. So if you don't like Blair Witch Project, you know, I don't know. We may have different, very different tastes. Um, I will say about Blair Witch Project, I was fortunate enough to be able to see it, like, opening weekend, um, I mean, I didn't think it was real, because I know people are like, oh, did you know it wasn't real? I didn't think it was real, because I was like, they're not going to make a movie about, like, these kids who died, like, their parents are going to, would never let that happen, um, <laughs> but, like, I mean, I guess now maybe they would, but at the time, I was like, obviously this isn't real, like, there's no way, like, five years ago these kids died and or disappeared and like their families are fine with them making a movie about it um but you know it's supposed to be like their release footage or whatever um but I was really fortunate in being able to see it in this like small theater in the Boston area that does like mostly indie movies and um like the audience it was packed like totally sold out um but no one, like, the entire movie was, it was silent in the theater. Like, I mean, people would laugh when it was funny, um, but then it came, when it ended, the entire theater just sat in the dark and in silence as the credits rolled. Like, we all just sat there. And I think, like, that experience really helped because I did see it again a few times. I brought other friends to see it at different theaters, and, you know, people would be talking, and and, like, I already enjoyed it, so I already knew what was coming. But, you know, I think it does infect it. And I, when I saw Paranormal Activity in the theater, people were just, like, talking through the whole movie about, like, nonsense. They weren't even talking about the movie. Um, and so I thought the movie was dumb, and I hated it, because 
it's like you really need to be in an environment where you can just truly buy into it. Um, and so I've watched, I've watched Blair Witch Project with friends and um, family who either didn't like it in the theater or hadn't seen it. Um, and, you know, if you just, I think if you're in the right setting and in the right mood, I mean, I do think those factors come into play more in that than in like other movies. Because it's like a, you could really have to be invested in believing in it and just kind of, because like not a lot happens and it's very slow and paced. It's not slow paced, but it like nothing super creepy happens for a little bit, like maybe half an hour. And then even the creepiness, it's like slowly builds to get terrifying. Um, but I couldn't go home after that movie. Like we were, we laughed at like, it was like 1030 at night. And we were driving home from Boston, and I was just like, and of course, like the drive home was on these like dark, like wooded roads, and I was just like, I am never going back in my house. I'm terrified of everything, and I was like, I will stop and eat like somewhere that's open 24 hours. I just cannot, I cannot go anywhere like quiet and home. Like I'm too scared, and so, so anyway, so it reminded me, vibe wise, kind of of that, you know, where like. You have to invest. It slowly builds to be creepy. Um, but then, like, it gets, like, it gets really, really intense. Um, so this is Chad Gets the Axe. Um, what I also thought this was really interesting about this movie is, so there's the running commentary, you know, of the viewers. And I thought it was really fun because that was very, very accurate. Um, I mean, one guy is just asking for feet pictures. Like, people are, like, just chatting about nonsense someone's promoting their own show um or their own stream or whatever um but it gets kind of deep like this movie actually really made me think and it was surprisingly like a lot more impactful than I expected I I finished the movie and I I said to my husband I was like that movie like surprisingly was like very thought-provoking and intelligent and had a lot to say, I think, about the state of, like, our society and, you know, our relationship with the internet and people on the internet. And um, so I I loved this movie. It was, like, surprisingly... I mean, I thought it would be, like, a fun, solid, maybe, like, three, four-star movie. And it would be, like, definitely a five-star movie for me. I loved it. Um... And would definitely watch it again. Really, really enjoy this. I recommend it. Like I said, my movie taste is very... I would say it's a little off, like, the norm. Um, and actually, I'll link to um, my top 100 movies. So you can decide if you and I have similar tastes. And if we don't, maybe skip anything. Um, and then we also watch Clue. Because we always watch Clue um, at the end of October. So, um, and I mean, if you haven't seen Clue, what are you doing? Go watch Clue. Um, so that's it. We'll be back in November. Hopefully we'll be a little more involved. I'm not making any promises. Um, things haven't totally, like, resolved. But I mean, hopefully we'll be back. And, you know, I'm feeling a lot better. So that's, you know, that's a starting point. Um, yeah, and I'm going to try to, sometime over the next week or so, try to, catch up and visit some people, um, on their pages and channels, and, um, since I know I've been kind of MIA for a bit, so, anyway, I hope you all enjoy your Halloween and have enjoyed October, and now we're heading into, um, Thanksgiving season, so, um, yeah, all right, bye!